Alayhi wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulayhi kareem. It's a pleasure and honor to uh, be with all of you today. Uh, as we all know that uh, IGNA Council for Social Justice has launched a series of webinars lifting up the plight of people in different parts of the world. Uh, last month we discussed uh, uh, the genocide in Bosnia, and the commemoration of 25 years of genocide uh, in Srebrenica. And this uh, month we are attempting to, uh, to recall and lift up the plight of our brothers and sisters in Kashmir uh, with an extraordinary panel. But before we start the program today, I'd like to um, request Dr. Zahid Bukhari, the Executive Director of uh, Islamic Circle of North America Council for Social Justice, uh, who has uh, been kind enough and visionary enough to, uh, to allow us and to give us this platform uh, to discuss, to explore, to understand, and also to recognize uh, our responsibility toward those who are subjected uh, uh, by human rights violations in different parts of the world. So Dr. Zahid Bukhari, please uh, say a few words about uh, sure. uh, today and about the CSJ programs. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really honored to have this very respectable and honored. I think the, uh, it's a very uh, wonderful uh, panel today. Uh, we have been doing, uh, as uh, Brother Shagil was mentioning, program on, uh, uh, on Kashmir. Uh, last year also, I think uh, we did uh, participate in rallies all over the United States in different parts of the cities and major rallies in Houston and uh, in New York, and then also <clears throat> the different webinars and the different type of campaign billboards, uh, a, a good campaign of billboards in Michigan and New Jersey and Florida and other part of the uh, other states. This year also, uh, we have, and we have been working with all other Kashmiri organizations. This is part of the DNA of uh, Ekana and Ekana CSA that we like to work with all other organizations which are working for the human rights or a right for uh, self-determination in Kashmir or, or any other issue. We love to work uh, together and participate in their program, invite them to participate in our program. This year uh, we did, one is uh, I think because this is COVID-19 and everything is uh, being done in that perspective. So we had a digital a human chain around United Nations uh, for Kashmir on August 5 and those who uh, who uh, participated that and sign up. So we sent a letter to the United Nations Secretary General on behalf of all those participants about Kashmir and it was a detailed letter. It is available on our website, iknacsj.org. Um, I think the, the, the letter is available. And also we did a webinar on that day. This is the second webinar uh, we are doing. And apart from that, as uh, Brother Shakil mentioned, we did a program on Bosnia. But before that, we also participated uh, in, in a very aggressive way uh, about this uh, police brutality and uh, systemic racism in America. I think in 10 uh, cities, our Ikhnasi has a chapter, they had rallies, they participated in other rallies. Uh, they also put uh, billboards and uh, petitions and all those different things. I think the, uh, they, they, they have done several activities. Now we are also doing a free Imam Jamil Alamin campaign and in several other cities. Uh, so it's a grassroots uh, campaign. Our, uh, especially our young one, young Muslims and brothers and sisters, uh, they, um, uh, they are running that campaign, free Imam Jamil, uh, uh, Imam Jamil Alamin. So that campaign is also, it's all almost, I think, the Ikna CSJ domain. We have uh, focus areas, uh, five, six, uh, seven focus areas. And we are we have been working on that, but uh, this uh, August fifth, especially, uh, we have been focusing on Kashmir issue and the plight of that issue. We recently had meeting with the State Department with the U.S. CMO, U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations. So Kashmiri leadership was there, Arab, uh, South Asian, different part of different national organizations. So we had uh, one and a half hour meeting, I think, with the State Department deputy principal deputy assistant secretary 
Uh, and the very uh, funny thing that uh, when we t- uh, told him and the Kashmiri leadership told him that they are changing the laws, changing the demographic composition of Kashmir. So he was saying that I heard a lot of rhetoric, but I need more proof and more data. So our Kashmiri leadership will be providing a dossier on that issue to, uh, to the State Department, inshallah. Ta'ala. So these are the just general uh, outline which uh, ICANA CSJ Council for Social Justice we are doing. And we again, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful, really uh, grateful that this panel is here. And we hope that we'll continue to work together, inshallah, in future. Thank you very much. You are mute. Yeah, Mr. Ali, uh, you are mute. Thank you so much. So I'm still uh, waking myself up with coffee in the state of California, where we are subjected to 100, 200, three degrees temperature this weekend. Uh, but welcoming back again to the entire audience throughout the country and, and, and outside the uh, United States, uh, we appreciate your participation as well this uh, morning or whatever time that you are in. Uh, allow me to say a few words, especially for our young brothers and sisters, uh, my children and, and others children who are in the U.S. who may or may not have been to Kashmir, uh, which is known to be the paradise on earth. Uh, I recall my visit uh, 35, 38 years ago. Uh, uh, One cannot but simply uh, uh, say thanks God for giving us this land. Uh, It's a a beautiful, beautiful place, a valley of Kashmir, which uh, uh, has rivers, mountains, beautiful people, awesome culture, uh, extraordinary uh, history. But most unfortunately, for the last uh, 70 plus years, uh, the rights of the people of Kashmir uh, is being uh, brazenly violated by the Indian government. As someone said, uh, Congress does uh, in uh, nighttime what BJP now is doing in the daytime. Um, Over the last, uh, particularly last one year, what we now know since August 5th, 2019 to today, just about a year plus, uh, the life of Kashmiri people has changed in dramatic ways. Uh, Complete lockdown, uh, arbitrary detentions, torture, killing, uh, incommunicado, millions of people there. Uh, People who are in diaspora here in the United States, unable to speak and check in on the welfare of their loved ones. Uh, And and all of this is happening in the name of, quote unquote, um, uh, democracy, the largest, oldest democracy of India. Uh, And we will talk a whole lot today. Uh, I would urge all of us to um, put in your questions, uh, take notes, uh, and and use the comment box where you are uh, in whatever platform you're watching. Uh, and uh, feel free to ask any questions that you may have. We have a distinguished panel uh, today. Uh, and our first speaker, I am um, privileged to introduce to you uh, my dear sister, Sahla Ashai, who is an attorney by profession, and her specialty is in immigration law. And we all know, those who are living in the United States, uh, what we are going through in the context of uh, immigration and xenophobia. Uh, in the United States. Uh, she also has uh, expertise in human trafficking and child protection. In other words, she's an attorney who doesn't make a whole lot of money. But, uh, she uh, helps people, uh, those who are voiceless. Uh, she has been also a labor organizer for taxi drivers who are abused by uh, uh, the Wall Street people in New York and elsewhere. Uh, and she has uh, done a lot of work, uh, relief projects in Haiti, uh, and uh, a program specialist in nonprofit program development. Sahla also has testified in congressional hearings on this issue of Kashmir. Uh, she originally hails from Kashmir with large family there and also here. And she will offer us uh, an overview of what has happened over this past one year, particularly uh, in um, violation of human rights of Kashmiri people in the name of uh, uh, 
loss by the Indian fascist government, current fascist government. Uh, and then she'll set it up and then we will go with other uh, speakers uh, in a uh, dig deeper into, into the issue. So Sahela, I uh, thank you for taking the time uh, today uh, away from your family on a weekend. Uh, God bless you for all that you do and all that uh, we are eager to hear uh, from you today. And take it away. It's all yours. Great. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Um, greetings to everybody here. Um, Shaquille Saab, thank you very, very much for uh, the honor of joining you here. Um, Dr. Bukhari, thank you to you as well. Um, I am truly honored to share this panel uh, with Sarir Fazli and uh, Professor Angana Chatterjee. So just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I am an attorney. I do not, in fact, make a ton of money. I do public interest law. And um, I am also um, a Kashmiri. My parents uh, were born and raised in Kashmir. My parents' families were separated by partition. I have family all over the subcontinent. Um, and I am from a family that has a long tradition of political resistance. And I take my freedom and my ability to speak openly about what's happening in Kashmir as a, a great gift that I'm very um, grateful for, that I do not take for granted, because uh, for Kashmiris to be able to speak freely about their political beliefs, their aspirations, um, they have for the last seven, eight decades been met with repression. So, um, this is just a little bit of background about myself to sort of explain to you what my skin in the game, so to speak, is. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is essentially the last year. Uh, one year ago, Kashmir was thrust onto the international stage uh, because of actions taken by the state of India. But what I want to be really clear about as a Kashmiri is that this was not uh, the beginning of the troubles in Kashmir. The 1990s were not the beginning, not even 1947 was the beginning. Um, Kashmiri people have for uh, close to a century been fighting for their own liberation movement for the ability to have self-rule and sovereignty over their land. So, you know, people often say India and Pakistan has a Kashmir problem, but you could equally say that Kashmir has an India-Pakistan problem. The concept of Kashmir, the identity of Kashmir predated the colonial ideas of India and Pakistan. So I, I want to be really clear about that. But last year on August 5th, the government of India revoked constitutional provisions granting partial autonomy to the state of Jammu and Kashmir and announced the creation of two separate federally administered union territories, which came into effect on August 30, uh, October 31st. So what that means is at the time of Kashmir's accession um, to India, which was a very fraught and uh, legally questionable accession, um, there were certain provisions that allowed Kashmir this special status within the Indian Union, um, in particular constitutional provisions that allowed it to define its own um, permanent residence, similar to the way we would define lawful permanent residency in the U.S. context or citizenship in the global context. Um, that's That was like one small piece among a few others that was protected within Kashmir. But to carry out these actions, India preemptively curtailed massive popular protest and dissent by imposing a severely repressive siege, including an intensification of already substantial troop deployments, communications blockades, undeclared curfews, widespread detentions, and other human rights violations. We are now beginning to analyze the, the implications of these massive legal transformations, which were carried out in contravention of international law and without the consent of the governed. India's unilateral and anti-democratic abrogation of Articles 370 and 35A did not change Kashmir's status as a disputed territory under international law to be resolved in accordance with binding UN Security Council resolutions on the basis of the principle of self-determination. Um, this decision, this brash decision, this you know um, exercise of military might affects the internationally recognized rights of parties of a multilateral dispute, and it cannot be cast as an internal matter for India. It's a violation of the Security Council resolutions, and quite frankly, it's simply an act of aggression. And this is an illegal annexation of a UN-recognized disputed territory, and it's an unlawful attempt to alter the rights of Kashmiri people who are the residents of that disputed territory. Um, 
for most Kashmiris at the time, in addition to the internet blockade, in addition to the human rights violations that were being scaled up, in addition to the cordon and search operations that were being scaled up, the abrogation raised grave concerns about sustainable development and human rights due to the impact on these key legal protections that affected Kashmir's um, economic, social, and cultural rights, as well as this fragile Himalayan ecosystem. Um, as Brother Shaquille mentioned, uh, Kashmir is in the Himalayas. It's uh, a, a naturally beautiful um, landscape. It's resource rich in many ways, um, but it is it is fragile and it has to have its development uh, done in a purposeful way and not in an, an extractive and exploitive way. So what happened with the abrogation is that it removed protections that prevented non-Kashmiris from purchasing land and establishing residency rights in the region. So one of the key takeaways from that is that there can now be massive demographic changes that could make Kashmiris minorities in their own homeland, undermining the the territorial rooting of the people that form the basis of Kashmiri ethnic identity, but it also will impact a UN supervised purposes should that ever come to be, which um, would be that if the if the Valley of Kashmir is populated by people who are not Kashmiris, a plebiscite no longer effectuates the will of the Kashmiri people. Um, Deforestation projects have escalated without India's own environmental review processes. Mineral blocks um, have been sold online at a time when Kashmiri businesses literally could not get online to compete. Um, and also we wanna take all of these actions into consideration with the, the broader picture of what is happening all over India, which is India's Discriminatory Citizenship Amendment Act, the CAA, which grants uh, citizenship to certain persecuted religious minorities, including Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists, and Zoroastrians, but not Muslims. Um, and nationwide protests against the CIA show that the CAA, when combined with the pending National Registry of Citizens, could have devastating consequences of essentially making uh, stateless, poor, and disadvantaged communities. More than 40 deaths and 200 injuries occurred um, further to state-led violence against Muslims in Delhi, which coincided with President Trump's visit to India in mid-February 2020. So if and when CAA and NRC are implemented in Kashmir, individuals who cannot produce documentation to prove their citizenship status will face mass imprisonment and deportation. So combined with the abrogation, the CAA and NRC could also contribute to ethnic cleansing of Kashmiris. So one of the sort of uh, insights that we have into this is that um, resettling Kashmir with a uh, Hindu population and establishing dominance of that majority religion has long been a project of the BJP from before it was even the BJP within it when it was its own the when it was a predecessor organization. So these are not far off concerns. These are part of the explicit agenda of um, this ruling party. So you may hear people talk about um, domicile law. Um, and domicile laws is, is akin to citizenship law. Um, in Kashmir, it was called state subjects. Um, and now it's being changed to a domicile law, which opens JNK to major demographic changes and it threatens the resolution of the dispute through referendum. So on May 18th of this year, the Indian government implemented its plan to change residency requirements to allow a wide range of non Kashmiris to qualify for residency and job rights. And these contravene international accords, commitments from previous Indian administrations, um, and it's drawn criticism from all of Kashmir's political parties, including those who are pro-India, because they believe it's intended to redesign the Union territory's demography while the country is battling the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, making ethnic Kashmiris a minority in their homeland is a long-standing goal of um, Hindu nationalists and would preemptively nullify frameworks for a political settlement. Indian armed forces have also been given new powers to commandeer lands considered strategic and laws requiring soldiers to obtain no so-called no objection certificates before acquiring land have been removed. So people are concerned about a major land grab. And again, I want to put it in the context of the military has been expropriating lands from Kashmir for a long time. But now what we're doing is we're, in, we're removing any legal impediment. And there is a clear push to see if uh, Kashmir can essentially be repopulated. Because what you have to understand is, despite the fact that 700,000 uh, military personnel have been deployed, despite the fact that there is a one to eight or one to 10 um, 
military to civilian ratio, Kashmiri people are, are still um, uprising and resisting Indian rule. So if you cannot quell um, this movement for self-determination with, with brutal repression, with wide-scale human rights violations, people are still persisting in demanding their right for self-determination. The only thing you have to, left to do is simply get rid of the people. And that's what these moves are designed to do. I know my co-panelists are going to talk to you a lot more about some of the human rights violations, and they're going to talk about some of the work they've done with their local partners. But um, some of what I would like to highlight for you is that um, the Indian court system, when it is applying its laws to Kashmir, has provided absolutely zero accountability for human rights violations. Even the internet blockage, uh, the internet suspension, um, which is widely criticized um, by the international community, you know, it was misreported that the Supreme Court of India somehow ordered the reinstatement of um, internet service. That's not true. The Supreme Court of India <clears throat> never even had a chance to review it properly because the government of India refused to provide the order um, suspending telecommunications. So the Supreme Court of India's decision was issued in the absence of having been provided the order, which it ordered the government to provide, and the government simply declined to do it. And so what the Supreme Court of India said is that, well, you have to provide a evidence that you've reviewed the situation when you're going to suspend telecommunications. That means there are no checks on this um, muscular exercise of executive power. Similarly, in the case of habeas petitions, habeas corpus means produce the body. It's a, a petition that you file when somebody is being detained and you want them to be released because it's either in violation of the law, violation of the constitution, um, and not one single person who was being detained, either administratively or otherwise, without charges, was released pursuant to a habeas corpus petition. No court ordered their release. It would be the government potentially releasing them on their own recognizance. So again, we have absolutely no checks on the power of what India is doing. And I think this reinforces the point that this cannot be glossed over as an internal matter for India, despite what the government of India may be saying about its court system, about its remedies that are available to it. Um, First, these rights are internationally guaranteed. There are international parties that have a stake in the outcome of this, um, in the stake in the outcome of this resolution of this conflict. Third, Kashmiri people are completely denied any protection of law under the Indian court system. Um, so, and this is another interesting fact, India actually tops the world in the number of internet shutdowns with 134 last year. And the post August 5th internet shutdown was the longest ever recorded in a democracy. So while they uh, may assure the international community that internet services are being restored, um, the internet shutdowns tracker, which is an online porter that tracks them, states that the communications shutdown is effectively ongoing. So right now, um, there is what 2G access. So if you are old enough to remember what that is like, nothing that you would be using, the websites that you would be accessing, anything like that would be able to come through to you very easily with 2G access. I mean, that is exactly the point. Again, if you cannot repress a people's persistent desire to determine their own future, what you have to do is you have to cut them off from the rest of the world and you have to basically get rid of those people because what the Kashmiri people have demonstrated to the government of India is that they will not, um, they will not back down. They will not let up in demanding their rights. Um, what's even more interesting is that India, which presumably has nothing to hide in Kashmir, doesn't let anybody else in. So they refuse to let UN observers in. They refuse to set allow a, a sitting U.S. senator in. Um, and they refused. They actually deported a U.K. member of parliament who tried to come to Kashmir. So again, um, this is not how. Uh, you know, democratic states that are friends with other democratic states treat each other. So, you know, what I also encourage the people who are listening to this today um, to take away is that the Indian government's party line on Kashmir is unreliable. Um, and if it was reliable, they would have no issue with international organizations coming into Kashmir to observe for themselves exactly what is happening. Um, I believe I have about one minute left. Is that correct? Take two. Take, take, take your time, take your well, time, so this better. I'll, um, I'll give you sort of my, my closing remark, which are 
Um, what we are asking the international community to do, what we are asking our Congress members to raise to their um, friends in the Indian establishment is that we want to appeal to India's conscience as a country. Um, uh, and we want other countries that um, believe in human rights and democracy to take the following actions. We're asking people to closely monitor the present danger of land possession and ethnic cleansing for Kashmiris. Just because it's happening and incrementally doesn't mean that it's not going to be a complete disaster. Um, we want our the international community to pressure India to provide full cooperation um, to the to UN special procedures mandate holders to make country visits and to allow full access to Kashmir. We want India to lift the communications restrictions, release detainees, and have true habeas corpus processes. Um, and we are asking um, for urgent debate, high level dialogue um, at the Human Rights Council sessions. Um, and we want the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights to report annually on the human rights situation in Kashmir. Um, we know that, uh, I, I believe it's the 2016 and 2019 reports, um, correct me if I'm wrong about those uh, dates, um, that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights issued, they were both not allowed into Kashmir, so they were relying on uh, local human rights documenters and um, NGOs to provide all of those. So um, we want accountability and we want transparency. Um, and ultimately the linchpin for all of this is Kashmiri people want to have a say in their political, economic, social, and cultural future. Um, that is actually a basic guaranteed human right and uh, you know, we, we may sometimes shy away when we're doing human rights work from talking about the principle of self-determination, but without a, um, without a just resolution of the claims to self-determination, there cannot be a lasting peace in this year. Thank, thank you so very much, Sela, uh, for giving us this uh, uh, breakdown of uh, Kashmiri people and Kashmiri history, which predates uh, the coming of India and Pakistan both. I know it's difficult to encapsulate all of that in a short period of time, but people have been intently listening to you. In, in the comments, I see uh, a great deal of comments. So uh, while we invite the next speaker, uh, you can browse through and see the questions that you might like to um, answer uh, in the toward the end. Our next speaker is uh, Brother Sarir Fazili. He too is an attorney and originally from uh, from Kashmir. Um, Sarir lives in New York and uh, a very active member in his community in Islamic Center of Rochester. And just like Sahla, he too has. Uh, testified in the congressional hearings on Kashmir, uh, and uh, he will lift up the impact of this uh, complete shutdown and lockdown in, in Kashmir over the course of past year, particularly, uh, and the the, the restrictions uh, to move around and, and speak with people, and and then a, a major toll on the lives of people in Kashmir and those whose loved ones live outside Kashmir, such as himself. Uh, so Sarir Fazili will um, offer us some real life stories of people uh, uh, and what has happened over this course of uh, past one year and, and, and beyond. Sarir, please take it away, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Shaquille Saab. Uh, alaikum, everybody. Uh, I offer my thanks to the organizers of this uh, of this event, uh, Zahid Saab uh, and Ikna has been a long friend of suffering Kashmiris, uh, and we we don't forget it, nor will we. Uh, I, I follow my sister Sala Shai. Uh, I call myself not a son of the soil. I was born and raised here in America, but a son of the son of the soil. Uh, my parents and family, like Salas, are from Indian occupied Kashmir. Uh, they have been there, uh, born and raised, uh, pre-partition days, and like she said. Uh, this is not a problem of 1947, but long before. Uh, I always start uh, when I speak uh, about Kashmir and Kashmiris. I remember the martyrs that have given their lives, uh, not just for independence, uh, but for their simple political rights, uh, whatever they wanted and however they felt. 
uh, and we remember those Shaheed today uh, and every day. I find it painfully ironic that as India must have celebrated its Independence Day today, uh, the curfew and the naked streets of Kashmir and what they look like, uh, whether they were uh, stray dogs roaming the roads, uh, whether they were just their um, 800 to 1 million, uh, 800,000 to 1 million occupational forces uh, enforcing a, a piece of the graveyard. Uh, but that is how Independence Day has been celebrated in Kashmir uh, for as long as I've been around and long prior. Uh, I look at not, not what has happened in just the last year, even though it's been a very painful thing, but as Salah said, uh, this is nothing new for Kashmiris. Uh, this is just more of the same piled higher and deeper. When we talk about the effects of August 5th, when Kashmir was effectively cut out and shut out from even communicating, Kashmiris were unable to even communicate with their neighbors uh, because their phones, both mobile as well as uh, landlines were cut off. No internet, no nothing. They were even if prevented from coming out of their homes. And when they were able to, to get their basic necessities, they were met with roadblocks, with guns. And every day, those roadblocks, those barricades were changed in a very systematic way to try to confuse and otherwise adulterate the minds of the Kashmiris because they didn't know where they were coming from and where they were going. It was just one part of that. Uh, that was just one part of their effort to try to suffocate the Kashmiris and, as Salah said, make them forget and give up what they have strived for for so long. I talk about uh, what Kashmiris have had just in the last year, what kind of treatment they've had from India. I'll start with a very superficial thing. Uh, I want to talk about business. It is reported, and I invite everybody that may watch this uh, to fact check me, uh, my contact information is always available from these organizers. There are reports that over $5 billion, that's with a B as in boy, dollars plus have been lost in economic uh, revenues uh, since August 5th. Kashmiris have been prevented from leaving their homes. Uh, this is pre-COVID. Let's not talk about what COVID has done to Kashmir and how India has exacerbated that problem. They've been unable to harvest their fields. Their Kashmir is known around the world for simple fruit harvests and apples, those have rotted on the trees uh, because they were unable to harvest them. Kashmiris have been unable to do any form of reasonable business since this thing started, this lockdown, uh, based on the fact that they didn't even have simple phone and internet access. They couldn't even arrange for uh, payments electronically for their children's uh, college tuitions and whatnot. That I'll, I'll touch that in a second, not to mention paying uh, business bills and trying to communicate with business partners. It has been, that's just a, a very basic thing I'm going to talk, I'm mentioning. Now I want to talk about how it affects people day to day and their most precious asset, and that's their children. There has not been even an ounce of educational progress in Kashmir in the last year. And I tell you, when Salah talked about the 2G internet access or lack thereof, you may as well be trying to talk between two cans and a string because... With 2G, uh, you cannot deliver online classes. You cannot upload video lectures. You can barely access a PDF. And study materials are just simply inaccessible. Salah talked about, and she stole my thunder a little bit, the highest number of days in the world where the internet has been suspended and blocked anywhere by any country, even the so-called rogue nations that we hear about all the time, are from India. How do you block the ability of people to seek information and news from the outside world and call yourself a democracy? You cannot. You should be shamed in doing so. But the inavailability, the unavailability of even internet access has crippled Kashmiri students of all ages. They are unable to seek and investigate opportunities outside of Jammu and Kashmir. And due to the lack of internet speed, and once it was finally restored, the congestion, and I give you an example of my niece who has some familial resources. She was forced to leave Kashmir, go to New Delhi, stay in a rented accommodation just for the simple ability to use the internet to look for a job. She's a trained 
educated doctor, and she was looking for her positions outside of the subcontinent in Kashmir, and she couldn't do that from the privacy and the safety of her own home. She had to go to New Delhi to do that. It's amazing that she had to travel an hour by air just to use the internet. That is just one example. And it is a gross minority of families that have the resources and the ability to do that. Now, I'll tell you, imagine a seven-month lockdown based on and because an already over-militarized region that had over one million armed occupational forces receiving even more forces coming in. And why? People saw it coming when reports would come in that another 30,000, another 50,000 forces have come in and have been landed in Kashmir. And why? The phones were cut. Internet was stopped. All classes were stopped. Can you imagine what it is like when your students, we're seeing it with COVID in America, how our students are being affected when they can't go to school. And at least after a little bit of time, we were able to get uh, our children some substitute of education virtually through the internet, through Zoom sessions, through whatever. These students didn't even have that uh, uh, available to them based on the fact that there was no internet. For seven months, they had no classes. After that, once that siege was lifted, perhaps with another three to three and a half weeks, then the shutdown and the lockdown came due to COVID. So there are reports that there have been fewer than 20 academic days in the Kashmir Valley since August 5th of 2019. We are over 370 days since then. And imagine there being 20 academic days and what that would do to your students, children, and grown, uh, the grown-ups of all ages. Now I ask you, how would your kids be able to get around that? Their, their career is their whole investment and in that of their parents. So what, what did they do? Some students, as is reported in the press, literally stood on the streets looking for teachers, professors, or students that were senior to them, hoping they would run into somebody who could explain some of the lessons to them and give them some guidance in areas where they just couldn't do it themselves. Teachers risked life and limb on many occasions to deliver notes in some very extreme cases to their students, knowing that they didn't have the ability to do so and learn on their own. Many households, unfortunately, lack the resources that are needed to buy smartphones, to buy laptops, desktops, and even tablets. How would those students, even if internet accessibility was given, be able to access just the basics in education. There are reports of students who said, we relied on our hardcore hardcover books, some notebooks, and our calculator. And I ask you to look in to what your uh, surroundings show you today as far as how kids are educated, forget America, but in other parts of the third world and see how quickly and how conveniently education has made them grow and help them. From a, from a standpoint of education, the lockdown has devastated Kashmir and its educational uh, system, period. The lockdown has not created new problems for Kashmiris. In fact, unfortunately, as uh, Salah said, it has exacerbated many. And one of the biggest is the lack of any due process in Kashmir as far as Kashmiris go. The Public Safety Act, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act allow for, under the PSA, two years of incarceration with no charges. So I don't even have to tell you why I'm locking you up. I'm just locking you up. The AFSPA is well known as notorious. It gives the armed forces pure, strict unaccountability. It allows them to act in whatever fashion they want. And then, because they're allegedly dealing with national security issues, whatever actions they take, whatever crimes they commit, they are without any ability to be challenged. Those have gone up many fold. And I give you a couple of examples pre-lockdown of what happened as far as when uh, there were massacres that were, uh, where Kashmiris were accused. I go back to the year of 2000 in, uh, when 36 members of the Sikh minority community were murdered. Uh, a few days later, five men were killed by uh, the army and were claimed, oh, we have killed uh, these terrorists who, who murdered those innocent six. Afterwards, the families of those five people came to know that, hey, our, our men are not back. 
an investigation was done, they were found to be innocents. They were laborers, they had gone out for work and they were picked up and made examples of and they were murdered and they were buried elsewhere. And when they were, when their bodies were found and the investigation done by the people and the human rights organization, they said these were innocents. The army in 2014 closed that case saying there was no evidence uh, one way or the other and we can't prove anything. That's just one. There have been numerous examples of fake encounters and forced disappearances and all reported in the uh, Kashmiri and even in the Indian press. Not a single punishment has ever been doled out to those responsible for these. At one time in, in an encounter known as the Machal encounter, the army actually said, yes, there was an issue and something happened. That finding was overturned at a higher level of army inquiry and those soldiers who were responsible were given a clean chip. So that tells you there is absolutely no accountability. I will take you to July 18th of 2020 when three laborers were murdered in cold blood in the Shopian district. They came from Jammu looking for work, looking for labor. They were buried in the dead of night in Baramula, a 70 mile distance from where they were killed. Takes three and a half hours to travel that distance by road in a car on the national highway. That should give you plenty of information on how and why things are happening in Kashmir under the cover of darkness, even in these days. The army has said they're going to investigate. That's going to be useless. We can tell you right now based on the AFSPA and the powers that they have. I'm gonna ask you just to do a search of the New York Times uh, post August 5th, and you'll hear, you'll read about the detained Numerous, hundreds of people were detained without charge and within a few days sent out of Kashmir, uh, most prominent of which was a relative of mine, Dr. Mubeen Shaw, a doctor by uh, education, but a businessman by profession, the former president of the Kashmir Chamber of Commerce and Industries. Uh, he was arrested in the dead of night on between, between August 4th and 5th, uh, and within 48 to 72 hours, he was sent to a jail outside of Kashmir. And why? His crime was his involvement in uh, political activities and his simple speech that Kashmir should be given its right to self-determination and Kashmir should be allowed to participate equally in the ultimate resolution of its own dispute. And he was very vocal about it. It took incredible political and legal pressure from outside of Kashmir, from numerous lawyers and human rights organizations and others to get him free after many months the pictures of Dr. Shaw when he was released as compared to when he was incarcerated will tell you all the stories that you need to know about what he was treated and how he was treated while he was incarcerated. He was allowed to leave and go back to his adopted home in Malaysia. And the, again, he was told, if you don't behave yourself and you don't shut up, the same thing is going to happen. We're not going to allow you to come back. Thereafter, Dr. Shaw had no compulsion to keep quiet. He continued to speak his conscience and even today, India has issued yet another warrant for his arrest based on him calling them to the carpet on what they have done and what they continue to do in Kashmir. Imagine the president of the Bar Association being arrested and held without charge, without any due process, zero, in uh, Kashmir. That is uh, Mia Abdul Qayyum. He is a known lawyer. He has represented many detainees many human rights victims, and he has been a staunch pro-freedom advocate. He has not been shy in uh, telling India and the rest of the world what's happening in Kashmir and where he stands. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and as a result, he has been imprisoned. He has severe health issues. He is unable to be seen or treated or what have you. And quite honestly, nobody knows what his current state of health is. And we are again asking that the Human rights organizations, the American Bar Association has been vocal about his case in specific, in particular, that he should be released unconditionally and allowed to seek and be given whatever medical treatment he needs. This issue of lack of due process slaps India in the face because there is absolutely no accountability. There are people uh, who have been slapped with the PSA number of times. And when their two years is up, as they're being led to the doors and the gates of the jail to leave, they're again slapped with another one. I will leave you with a final one, I'm sorry if I'm over my time, with the brutal attack on the press 
There is absolutely no free press in Kashmir. And I give you but one example. A 26-year-old young woman, Masrat Zara, was charged as being an anti-national under the Unlawful Activities and Prevention Act. What was her crime? She was uploading pictures and articles that were a part of her job. She is a member of the press. She is a member of the press. She, her articles have appeared in the Washington Post, TRT World, Al Jazeera, and others. She was charged because she was allegedly indulging in anti-national activities on social media. They claimed that her photos would provoke the public to disturb law and order and glorify anti-national activities and dent the image of law enforcement and cause disaffection across the country. And that's a quote. Uh, what is her possible sentence for engaging in such horrible behavior? Up to seven years of imprisonment in jail. She's a journalist. Her photos and reports were part of her job. So you can see the attack on Kashmiris is not just coming on their physical being. Kashmiris have given over 100,000 lives uh, since 1990, countless others prior there too. Now you are seeing not just more physical attacks, incarceration with no ability to change, challenge that incarceration, the lack of due process. You have attacks on controlling their education with a lack of uh, internet, no school whatsoever, inability to conduct business, uh, forget amongst themselves, but outside of Kashmir, and now even on the ability of the press to report. I will communicate to all of you, I have been involved with this movement uh, since 1990 here in America. We have spoken with members of Congress, with Senate, with the State Department, with numerous human rights organizations, with numerous uh, UN member organizations. I echo the plea that uh, Sala gave previous, uh, prior to my speaking. It is incumbent upon any freedom-loving, conscious-holding people to speak to anybody that they think that can help us in not only getting the message out of what's happening today, but in pursuing and supporting the Kashmiris' dignified right to self-determination without pressure from either side. I thank the organizers again for allowing me this uh, time to speak on this extremely uh, qualified panel. Uh, I don't think I, I was able to do it justice, uh, but I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siri. No, indeed, you have given us a whole lot of uh, information that will help us uh, to reach out to our congressional representatives who I believe are in summer recess in our districts. Uh, it's an extraordinary opportunity for, uh, uh, for all of us really to simply call our local elected congressional rep and ask him or her about uh, if they need any information on Kashmir. And, and we will post some of the websites that provides a great deal of information on Kashmir. Unfortunately, many of the congressional reps also do not know, and they need some education about the plight of Kashmiri people in, in Kashmir. So thank you so much, Sarir, for providing us this uh, insight uh, uh, information. Um, the last speaker uh, is uh, our um, uh, a well-known uh, person uh, within the Kashmiri movement and outside the Kashmiri movement in the human rights work. Uh, Professor Angana Chatterjee is uh, co-chair of the Political Conflict, Gender and People's Rights Initiative at UC uh, Berkeley. Uh, and she is a cultural anthropologist and her um, work is focused on issues of political conflict and uh, majoritarian nationalism, religion in the public sp uh, space, uh, and cultural survival. Uh, in Kashmir, Dr. Chatterjee co-founded and convened the People's Tribunal on Human Rights and Justice. Uh, and, uh, and later she also founded the People's Tribunal on Religious Freedom and Human Rights in Odisha. Um, and, uh, and then in um, 2004, she served on a independent commission on displacement and rehabilitation of the Narmada Valley. So not only she's involved in the work in Kashmir, but also the abuses of Indian people in India. Uh, her publications include a, a great many, but uh, uh, some of the major ones, Majoritarian State, How Hindu Nationalism is Changing India, uh, recently published last year in 2019, uh, 
conflicted democracies and gendered violence, uh, Kashmir, the case for freedom, uh, which is a uh, 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 compiled uh, uh, book on essays by Tariq Ali, Hilal Bhatt, Angana Chatterjee, Habba Khatun, and Arundhati Roy, an extraordinary good book. Uh, and indeed, the last but not the least, which is a uh, heart-wrenching uh, report called Buried Evidence, Unknown, Unmarked, and Mass Graves in Kashmir, written in 2009, almost uh, 11 years ago. And Lord only knows what all must have happened from 2009 to 2020. Uh, and so much, uh, uh, so much to uh, grieve about, so much to, uh, to mourn about. Uh, but Professor Angana Chatterjee is uh, a U.S. resident uh, and uh, is unable to travel to India, and then she will talk more about this. But uh, uh, Professor Chatterjee will talk to us about this place called Kashmir, where Sahla and Sarir has highlighted uh, people living with zero rights and no due process. And what does it do to uh, to uh, to the people, what does it do to the uh, inherent and innate right of any people for self-determination? Uh, so I think Professor Chatterjee will uh, enlighten us with her insight into her work and the status uh, of Kashmir today. Professor Chatterjee, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Akhil Bhai. I'm honored to be here on this panel and uh, thank the distinguished speakers before me. Um, I will try to speak uh, comprehensively about a few things and please let me know when I have uh, about five minutes to go. I would appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, August 5 is a day of mourning in Kashmir. On this date in 2019, Kashmir's autonomy was countermanded by the Indian government. Conditions on the ground in Kashmir are in a state of emergency. It is a place of no rights, shackled in concertina wire, suffocated in a state of interminable lockdown. Kashmiris live in a context akin to collective internment. Every neighborhood is impaired and each life is impacted. A complex system of impunity laws is used to enforce militarized governance these laws extend immunity to one of the largest military forces in the world. Some of the laws have been named, and I wish to reiterate, they include the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act that renders organizations unlawful and criminalizes their membership. Um, then the Official Secrets Act charts the framework for def uh, definition and action of espionage, sedition, and other potential and perceived threats to the nation. Jammu Kashmir Public Safety Act authorizes the detentions of a person for up to two years without a trial. In 2011, long ago, Amnesty International had estimated eight to 20,000 persons had been jailed under the PSA over two decades. The National Security Act that authorizes federal and state governments to detain individuals for a maximum of 12 months and refuse lawyers to detainees for a certain period of time. The Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which was just named, um, I want to uh, just underscore that among the special powers that it enables includes arrest without warrant of any person who has committed a cognizable offense or against whom a reasonable suspicion exists that he is has committed or is about to commit an offense. And then the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act amended in 2019. Um, the amendment allows the central government to designate individuals and not only organizations as terrorists. The UAPA further may be used to affect the life imprisonment and the death penalty. Across Kashmiri civil society, where Muslims are in a majority, India is viewed as an occupying power. India state forces have reportedly carried out extrajudicial executions, killing and targeting Kashmiri civilians, predominantly men, for unproven offenses. The rule of law has long since collapsed. 
unrelenting militaristic and legal hostility to social dissent targets Kashmiri civilians, journalists, lawyers, laborers, academics, health professionals, students, and their allies. The alignment of national security with aggressive majoritarianism in India prohibits reflection on why Kashmiris resist. Such reflection itself is presented as seditious. Since 1990, I'm just going to talk about the last 30 years. Since 1990, Kashmir attests to extraordinary human rights crimes, including enforced disappearances, gendered and sexualized violence, displacement, torture, extrajudicial executions, the death penalty, and the burial of civilians in unknown, unmarked, and mass graves. Non-governmental sources estimate between 70,000 and 90,000 people have died, including from extrajudicial executions. More than 8,000 have been involuntarily disappeared. A large number of minority Hindu pundits, too, have been displaced. The unknown and marked, un unmarked graves are a vital component of the historiographic record. They hold indispensable local knowledge of deliberate and methodical destruction of Kashmiris. In December 2009, I was privileged the year before with Pervez Imros to convene the International People's Tribunal on Human Rights and Justice. And we released in December 2009 our report, Buried Evidence, documenting 2,700 unknown graves, holding more than 2,943 bodies. The graves function as material repositories of culture, kin, and community that have been destroyed. The graves are markers of an inheritance and the bodies bear evidence to massified death. The graves attest to what is lost and what is wrong. The narrative of a mother as told by her family who I met, who sleepwalks to the unmarked grave of her son, chronicles her attempts to resuscitate his body. Between 2011 and 2016, allegedly 3,000 3, additional unmarked graves were identified by local organizations and require documentation, verification, and corroboration. It is dangerous to speak of the graves or to seek justice. The graves delimit the space of bare life, in which a life outside the impact of the graves, a life of rights, becomes impossible. Line in the sand. The social and political breakage of Kashmir today has its genesis in history. The unchecked spread of majoritarianism in India through the decades during which Hindu nationalists were not in elected office created political and legal contexts whereby the dismantling of Kashmir can now occupy center stage in government. Regional wars have been fought between India and Pakistan over Kashmir throughout the last several decades including during 1947-48 after British rule ended in the subcontinent and in 65, 71 and 99. The Indian constitution adopted in 1949 extended special status to Jammu and Kashmir through Article 370. Article 370 prescribed Jammu and Kashmir's association with India, symbolizing the contract between the two entities. Article 370 underscored Jammu and Kashmir's autonomy, including certain specified powers apportioned to the Indian government as defined in the instrument of accession. Jammu and Kashmir acquired its own constitution and was not subject to the constitutional oversight that governs states in the Indian Union. As stipulated in the instrument of accession, per Article 371b, the Indian legislature could only sanction laws pertaining to communications, defense, and foreign affairs. Other caveats of the Constitution of India may be extended to Jammu and Kashmir. However, fundamental to this outcome was the imperative that neither India nor Jammu and Kashmir may independently alter or discontinue 370 without arriving at an agreement. Yet, shortly after the assumption of the constitution, India's successive governments began to unilaterally modify the principles of 370. These modifications were derived through the government's powers to siege, I'm sorry, seize Jammu and Kashmir's legislative jurisdiction and independence and disband elected state governments. A record number of 47 presidential orders were issued under Article 370 between 1954 and 94, 
affixing 260 of the 395 articles in the Constitution of India to Jammu and Kashmir. The Indian government used these presidential orders to expand the mandate of most Indian laws and institutions to Kashmir, extending the will of the Indian Republic to subsume Kashmir's self-governance. Alongside the Indian state, renounced its commitment to establishing a plebiscite, despite promising to do so in domestic and international contexts in the late 1940s and early 50s. Two United Nations Security Council resolutions had conveyed the same requirement of India and Pakistan. Kashmiris commenced an armed insurgency in 1989. During this period, local and cross-border militancy reports support from Pak received support from Pakistan. By the st Indian state's own records, however, armed militancy linked to foreign groups reportedly abated by 2004 and 6 as a local and non-violent movement ensued. Unlike Article 370, Article 35A, the permanent residence law, had endured through time. Affixed to the Constitution of India, Article 35A defined Kashmiri rights to land critical to their self-professed struggle for self-determination. It prohibited those from outside Jammu and Kashmir from purchasing land and establishing permanent residency. Article 35A ensured access to and control over land, which is fundamental to preserving a people's cultural identity, economic sanctity, and political standing. The Hindu rights election in 2014 and re-election in 2019 has profoundly impacted Kashmir. Casteist, racist, and heteronormative, the government led by Narendra Modi incorporates populism, nationalism, authoritarianism, and majoritarianism. Its actions against vulnerable communities and minority groups has evidenced abject disregard for democracy. Hindu nationalists have sought to weaponize religion and politics to incite the Hindu majority. Kashmiri Muslims and their allies have been repeatedly depicted as enemies of India and as potential agents of terror. In response to chronic oppression, Kashmiri civil society continues to take to the streets in large numbers. These protests bear expressions of profound grief, fatigue, heartbreak, rage, resilience and resistance. Local social movements for justice and accountability are routinely met with extreme repression from Indian forces. In Srinagar, it is reportedly recorded by the Sri Maharaja Hari Singh Hospital that between mid-2016 and 2018, 1,253 persons were blinded by metal pellets used by state forces. According to the U.S. State Department, in 20. 18, approximately 160 civilians were killed extrajudicially, the most in over a decade. Kashmir's population lives with recurrent psychosocial trauma and a high rate of suicidal behaviors. Individual and collective mourning is truncated, forcing loss and trauma to be internalized. In revoking Kashmir's autonomy on August 5, 2019, the Indian government unilaterally nullified Article 370 and revoked 35A to disestablish the state of Jammu and Kashmir and divide it into separate unions' territories under the direct rule of the self government. In parallel, between December and August and December, sorry, 2019, prejudicial citizenship laws akin to the Nuremberg laws instituted in September 1935 in Nazi Germany were configured for implementation across India. These laws privilege Hindus in defining citizenship and place the rights and protections of religious minorities at grave risk, particularly targeting Muslims. In August, in July, sorry, July and August last summer, tens of thousands of additional troops were reportedly deployed in Kashmir and Jammu. Following August 5th, Kashmir witnessed the reported torture of children, the elder, elderly and women, sexualized violence, illegal and mass detention, house arrests of political leaders, curtailment of freedom of speech and movement and dissent, and the falsification of social facts by the state and the closure of sacred places. People were afraid to approach the course lest the extra legal detention be converted to formal detention. 
The impact on Kashmir's political economy was devastating, leading to a reported loss of 2.4 billion. In August, soldiers reportedly fo forced 12 civilian men to remove their clothes and line up naked on the main road in Pulwama and beat them severely and electrocuted their genitals. The tortured were reportedly forced to lie atop each other. Additional and similar acts of torture have also been reported. Fahmida Banu died from inhaling tear gas and pepper gas grenades reportedly fired by police personnel during a civilian protest near her home in Srinagar. At the 44 Rashtriya Rifles camp in Shropian, armed forces personnel reportedly tortured three men and broadcast their cries over loudspeakers. In September, police reportedly shot pellets and tear gas at religious processions in Srinagar during Muharram, injuring more than 100 people. Between August and December of last year, 32 civilians were reportedly killed. These events have led to increasing and urgent concern among civil society and international human rights institutions. In October 2019, as many of you know, the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs convened a hearing on the subject. By March 2020, with the advent of COVID-19, Indian state forces repeatedly identified by Kashmiris as perpetrators of abuses against civilians were given extended responsibilities during the health emergency, expanding further their reach of over civilian life. Persons detained, including warrantlessly, were not released. Journalists continued to be denied access. Internet services remained restricted and civilians were reportedly denied access to in information from non-state regulated sources. Between January and June of this year, again, 32 civilians have been reportedly killed as documented by an advocacy group. Health services already strained have reached a breaking point. In May, Hazim Safi Bhatt, a teenager with disabilities was reportedly killed by the Central Reserve Police Force personnel in Kupwara. Police and paramilitary reportedly raided Nusrulapura village in Bargaon, attacking residents and looting and vandalizing properties. They assaulted women and tied men to trees and assaulted them. Armed Forces personnel reportedly shot bullets and pellets at a civilian society demonstration in Avantipura, protesting the killing of a militant commander, Rais Naiku, killing an individual and injuring at least 25. Also in May, this May, the Indian government removed certain legal barriers to permanent residency in Kashmir, which can potentially reconstitute Kashmir's demographic makeup and render Muslims in a minority. The proposed deprivation of the right to land is intensified by the reported seizure of land, including private property, by Indian forces in Kashmir. Two new decrees expanded the parameters for residency. Following May, the powers conferred by Article 35A to determine and guarantee rights and privileges to permanent residents of Kashmir were transferred to the government of India. These extend the right to acquire immovable property, to reside lawfully in Jammu and Kashmir and seek employment in the private sector. These new rules permit Indian citizens living for 15 years in Jammu and Kashmir to receive domicile certificate with residency benefits. Eligible persons who may become lawful permanent residents of Kashmir now include long-term inhabitants and their children, government officers and their children, and registered migrants and their children. For proponents of Kashmiri self-determination, this is especially damaging. Demographic reconstitution stands to diminish the integrity of Kashmiris as a people. It imperils their right to place and to language. It endangers their claims to internal self-determination and in turn the claims of external self-determination from alien exploitation and subjugation. Contemporary relations position the Indian state as righteous protectors of the national domain and Kashmiris as impostors on their land. The reconstitution of domicile law in May will likely induce dangerous effects. 
It may subdue the appearance of political conflict in Kashmir by rearranging the facts on the ground while suppressing and dissipating movements for freedom, justice and accountability. This unmitigated implementation of states of exception, whereby the law is used to suspend a binding contract between peoples, seeks to make absolute India's rule of power over Kashmir. The 2019 and 2020 decrees were implemented without the consent of the Kashmiri people. The actions of the Modi government were based on the violent assertion that the government of India possesses unilateral authority to rescind Jabu and Kashmir's constitutionally secured autonomy. The invalidation of 370 destroyed the very constitutional safeguard that could make the nullification of 370 against the law contra legum. It made the subsequent action of the, or it sought to make the subsequent actions of the in Indian state possible and sought to place such actions outside the bounds of the law. I'll end in a minute. This next moment, the Indian government has manifest majoritarian rule through the politicization of religion and Islamophobia in Kashmir. Kashmiris are apprehensive that the events over the last year could compel another armed uprising in an already volatile region. They fear genocidal intent on part of the Indian state in cultural and perhaps physical form. They ask to be recognized as principal stakeholders in all matters pertaining to Kashmir's present and future. In this new Kashmir, the ground has cracked open, a Kashmiri woman told me after the events of last August. All the fear and misery and terror of yesterday is channeled into a new and unknown tragedy that is exploding. It feels like a mass, like massive prison glades have clamped shut around our Kashmir, our neighborhood and my heart, she says, we can't breathe. Atta Muhammad, who died in 2016, was the grave digger and caretaker of the unknown graves at Chehal in Baramulla district in Kashmir. He said to me in 2011, we live among these graves. People in Kashmir fear that they could be put in such a grave. Survival in Kashmir means learning to live with death. These toxic histories born of feudal, colonial, post-colonial and majoritarian intersectionalities shape present day Kashmir. Through the protracted conflict, the experience of massified violence, securitization and social and actual death have scarred individual and collective life across generations. The four phases of Indian rule in Kashmir, 1949 to 89, 1990 to 2002, 2004 to 2019, and since August 2019, have progressively heightened the precarity of life. These conditions render a life of rights impossible. The deployment of brutality and the evisceration of entitlements exist on the edge of legality in Kashmir and threaten the erasure of a people. Thank you. Um, I, for one, feel uh, I'm going to just uh, take a deep breath um, and recompose myself. Uh, bless your heart for sharing what you shared. Um, it's gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching. Uh, words fail me to um, process this. Um, but thank you and, and, and uh, uh, God bless you for uh, the work that, uh, that you do uh, and giving voice to the voiceless people in, in Kashmir. Uh, I, I have a few questions, but if any of you, uh, uh, all, all three of you would like to um, comment or ask a question to each other, please do so. Otherwise, I have a few questions to each one of you. Hearing none, um, Sadir, you uh, uh, have... Uh, uh, lifted up the uh, uh, issue of uh, arbitrary detentions and arrests of uh, of people, um, civilians, and those even who are uh, 
uh, elected officials and those who are activists and those uh, who are speaking up and so on. And um, I read in um, one of the pieces in September 2019, the National Federation of Indian Women reports that there are 13,000 young people had been locked up. And then as early as in March 2020, two months ago, the Indian Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, reports 7,357 people have been arrested arbitrarily. So these thousands and thousands of people, young and old alike, who are being thrown into the jails, what happens to them? What You talked about due process, certainly, but uh, how does that impact the lives of those individuals, their siblings, their family members? What does it do to the collective psyche of people? I, I would love to be able to tell you what happens to them. Uh, unfortunately, nobody knows what's happening to them while they are incarcerated. One thing I did not touch on was the fact that after August 5th, amongst the detainees were minor children. And when I say minor, I'm talking about kids and boys as young as 9 and 10 and 11 years old. And they were not being housed in the local neighborhood jail Many of them were sent outside of Kashmir to faraway states in extreme heat with no one to look after or over them. And I'm talking about, you know, we have kids that age and I'm, I don't let mine go to the mailbox alone, not to mention going outside the country uh, and being sent without anything. Now, you ask about what that kind of lockup and lockdown situation does to those people and those families. Families have been broken, waiting for their people to come home. Mothers have died with no, no knowledge of where their kids, and I'm talking about grown adult children are. When we talk about enforced disappearances, we talk about uh, mass graves. These things have been discovered, they've been reported, and they've been published. And families have a very difficult time in being able to afford the resources and get around the fact that uh, unless you really know somebody or are in the know, you cannot get confirmation of whether your kith and kin are dead, are sent in some foreign jail, or are God knows where. Um, so you talk about mental trauma and torture, that is the first thing. Now the siblings, spouses, the term half-widow, if you could ever come up with such a foolish term, was coined, based, and thought about and came about in Kashmir. Why? Because the husband was taken away, uh, murdered, incarcerated, what have you, and his surviving spouse couldn't prove that he was dead. They would say he has been gone somewhere for militant training or what have you when we don't know where his body is. Uh, and they, they call her a half widow. No benefits, no nothing at the mercy of, uh, of all theirs. The, the, the government, I'm just going to say, uh, I'll close with government. The pro-Indian Kashmiris are well known. Even they were locked up in their homes on August 4th and 5th. Not a single one of them attempted to seek any kind of meaningful redress of their situation in the courts. Even today... Those people are saying, oh, until our statehood is uh, returned, until this is done, that's done, we will not participate in elections. The last thing Kashmiris are waiting for and need is another staged election. So I, I tell you uh, the mental trauma, the description of somebody as a half-widow, and the lack of any communication or access to those detainees or martyrs, the, the, the trauma is so severe uh, it's indescribable. Thank you. Thank you, Sari. Would uh, Sahla or Angana would like to add anything to that? Um, so, I mean, I, if I remember correctly, the question is kind of what is the uh, impact of these detentions on the broader community? Right. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is that um, it's not just the actual detentions, but it's the far reaching laws that have an impact on the community. So people know that the Public Safety Act exists, for example. Um, the Public Safety Act was the Jammu and Kashmir Public Safety Act. And when Kashmir was forcibly reorganized, um, 
last year, one of the laws that they managed to keep, that they decided to keep, was the Public Safety Act. And that is a law that, um, um, as Professor Chatterjee mentioned, it allows the administrative detention. So that means you can go to jail because you're suspected of doing something to impact public order. And that was the law under which uh, Mia Abdul Qayyum, the attorney, was detained. And so when you detain someone under a preventive detention law, the message that you're sending is extremely clear. You can say, we don't have evidence to prove that you committed a crime, um, but we are going to detain you under a law that is administrative, which means that when you have a criminal case, you have a right to counsel. You have a right to be represented. The Public Safety Act specifically bars you from being represented by an attorney. And um, he was essentially detained for a year, which is the maximum authorized by um, the law. So the law says, I can detain a person. The government can detain whoever they want because they're suspected of um, disrupting public order. And in this case, they detained somebody who was a professional, who was an attorney, who was a person who clearly believed in the rule of law by his choice of profession. And they detained him anyway. And I think the message was to be very clear. It doesn't matter if you are a privileged person. It doesn't matter if you are not privileged person. Um, you will still come under the heavy hand of the state. Um, and he was ultimately released again, not because a court ordered his release, but because the government did not contest that the period of his detention had expired um, and they released him at the end of that period. So again, I wanna reiterate, you know, these um, detentions are strategic and um, the actions that are taken are strategic. They're designed to instill fear. They're designed to um, really harm not just one person, but to harm the psyche of the whole community. And um, it, the, degree to which uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is prevalent in Kashmir has been extremely well documented. So anybody who's watching who wants to read more about it, um, I think it's Doctors Without Borders that has issued a report. Um, and uh, uh, Sreer or Professor Chatterjee, you may uh, be able to reference the reports that I'm, I'm not able to recall, but I do know MSF did one um, about the scale of post-traumatic stress disorder. And the question is, how do you recover from trauma when the trauma is ongoing? Um, and I don't really have a good answer to that. And so I think that's really part of what uh, people in Kashmir are facing. There has never been any normal, not as long as I've been alive, not as long as my parents have been alive. Um, there is no uh, normalcy in Kashmir because it has always been the site of people being denied their basic human rights to have a say in their future. You're, you're muted, Shakil Thank you. Thank you, Sela. Uh, can I stay with you and ask a follow-up question, Sela? So you discussed in your conversation earlier about uh, various laws, mm -hmm. and one of the laws that you mentioned about is the uh, domicile law. Mm -hmm. um, can, can I um, frame that in the context of uh, a demographic engineering project where settler colonialism is going to happen by displacing indigenous people of Kashmir and replacing them with Indian people of Kashmir. Correct. Sure, so I mean, um, at the time that state subject law was promulgated, it was promulgated when Kashmir was under the rule of uh, a minority Maharaja, who was the Dogra Hindu Maharaja. And at the time, very few people were landowners. And so what that state subject law did was it allowed preferential hiring to people who are state subjects of Jammu and Kashmir, but the people who were really um, benefiting from that preferential hiring were Dogras and Kashmiri Hindus because they represented the predominant um, educated class that was receiving um, that was receiving these posts. And again, land was concentrated in the hands of very few. So Kashmir has the distinction of being one of the very few places or perhaps the only place in South Asia where land reforms occurred and land was given to the tiller without compensation. So there was actually a transfer of wealth um, to, to people who were tilling the land. And so now land ownership is a lot more um, dispersed equally. So now land is a very um, important part of um, the uh, not only emotional or spiritual ties to land, uh, but economic, because when you have um, an economy that has been surviving decades upon decades of occupation, there, there are very few um, sources of stable wealth. And one of them is government employment and one of them is land ownership. So um, 
this protection that existed in Article 35A that allowed the Jammu and Kashmir um, Assembly to define who is and who is not a state subject slash permanent resident of Kashmir became very important, not only as a practical matter, but as um, as a psychological piece as well. This was something that was understood to protect Kashmiri land ownership, despite the fact that there are 700,000 troops in Kashmir, despite the fact that the military routinely expropriates land from people who live there, despite the fact that companies nevertheless were able to execute 99 year land leases and conduct business there. So, um, but now what is happening, what is the government is doing is they're actually taking state land and giving it to private actors from India. And that is the, the, the shift that is making very clear the demographic change intent. Kashmir is very obviously not an integral part of India. There is no part of India that has 700,000 troops to keep it integrated into the union, correct? So um, when we're talking about settler colonialism, this has always been an explicit goal of the BJP and they're very similar, um, they're very similar um, uh, strategies that are being used in other colonies and other colonized territories in other parts of the world. Um, I think that it's the, the, to me, what is really distinct now about this phase of the occupation is that not only is land being expropriated to the state, but the state is now giving land to outsiders. And the ruling party has made an explicit agenda of saying this land needs to be returned to the original and the real owners of this land which are Hindu Indians. It's very, very clear. <clears throat> Um, the other thing is that um, I, I feel um, it's sort of being weaponized is Kashmiri pundits who were exiled from Kashmir in the 1990s are being um, induced to return in actual, they're calling them settlements, right? These um, areas and parts of land that would be just for them, that would have the protection of the military. And that is an alien concept to how Kashmiri society existed. There were no... Um, you know, cordoned off enclaves of minority communities. These are communities that were pretty heterogeneous. Um, and even within religious groups, within ethnic groups, they were heterogeneous in their beliefs and their practices. So it's a really alien concept. And I think it would be absolutely harmful, not only to um, the Kashmiri Muslims who live there, but to um, any minority who seeks to return um, under the protection of an occupying force. Thank you, thank you. Angana or, or Sarir, would you like to add anything to? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Please. Yes. Okay. Yes. Just a couple of things. I think that um, land is integral to the notion of a people, to the idea of a people, and their capacity to uh, have a history to endure through that history, to endure that history, and to um, foster an identity as a collective. And if claims to land are diluted, if you look at uh, indigenous peoples, populations in uh, almost anywhere in the world, uh, including uh, Tibetans, for example, and you look at uh, the ways in which dispossession occurred, dispossession of land, uh, the breakage that it seeks to institutionalize is that the notion of a people becomes diluted through that breakage. And once the notion of a people becomes diluted, then obviously it endangers all manner of claims, all manner of possibilities, all manner of desires, whether it is to self-determination, to having a political voice, uh, to having a sense of self as Kashmiri, for example. So I think it is very calculated, as uh, uh, calculatedly engineered. And this has been on the Hindu rights uh, agenda for a long time. So this is not something new. It's able to be affected now, but it's been part of a promise, a promissory note by the Hindu right uh, for, for a long time uh, as a way of sort of uh, uh, domesticating Kashmir. And I think uh, parallel to that or intersecting with that, I just wanted to comment on India's uh, continued use of impunity laws. I wanted to mention that there are, for example, one uh, uh, 
collected sources of or a few collected sources of data uh, had uh, we could reach a conclusion that says 4360 encountered uh, recorded encounter deaths occurred these are fake encounter uh, deaths occurred in which one alleged militant was killed which shows the systematic extrajudicial killing and the excessive use of force so to look at the, the loss of land, but to look at, at a parallel, the continuation of the forms of violence and violation that have been ongoing, especially since 1990, is what makes it uh, unbearable and urgent and critical. And I just wanted to say that for people listening in this country, it is very important to raise one's voice internationally and to ask that the international community not be silent, even though they have said more than before, even though there's been more headlines and bylines on Kashmir than before since August 5th, but more action needs to happen. And India cannot, the relation of uh, larger states cannot simply be to India, cannot simply be based on India's markets. Uh, it has to be based on uh, a, a descent to such violations. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, you talked about buried evidence, Angana, earlier in your conversation. And I like to read a paragraph from your piece, The Militarized Zone, that was in Kashmir, the case for Freedom Book, uh, particularly for our audience, because this is, um, and I want to make a reference to this and ask a question. You write, in December 2009, the tribunal released a report entitled Buried Evidence, which documents and I like people to pay attention to this, 2,700 hidden, unmarked, and mass graves containing 2,943 bodies, mostly of men, across 55 different villages in Bandipura, Baramulla, and Kupwara districts of Kashmir. These bodies bearing the marks of torture, burns, and desecration. They were dragged through the night and buried next to homes, fields, and schools. The graves were dug by locals on this village land at the behest of the Indian military, paramilitary, and police. The Indian forces claimed that these graves house foreign militants. In most cases, the bodies have been exhumed and identified. And when they have been, the dead were revealed to be local people, ordinary citizens killed in fake encounters. And I can go on, but uh, what reminds me when I read this, when I hear this, last month in July, we hosted uh, uh, two Bosnian intellectuals from Bosnia. And they too reminded us that the genocide that occurred on July 11, 1995 in Srebrenica, the bodies are still being exhumed to identify them of the people because they were buried in different graves, different parts were buried in different graves. Now they call that genocide. So having read what I just read, what's happening in Kashmir today, uh, why should I not be able to call that it is a genocide that's happening in Kashmir? The theme of our program today is genocide in Kashmir, question mark. So I'm trying to find an answer if there is a genocide happening in Kashmir. Uh, I think that one of the things I wanted to underscore from what you read from Buried Evidence is, you know, a lot of uh, records were not available to us. Mostly the bodies were buried and they had not been exhumed. But uh, we were, uh, av the, of the 49 bodies buried, uh, there were some cases, 49 cases were available for us to study. And all 49 had been recorded as militants or foreign insurgents uh, by the Indian forces. 
Following investigations, we found that 47 had been killed in fake encounters, 41 were identified as local civilians, one was identifiable as a local militant, seven were unidentified, and none were identifiable as foreign insurgents. So the, one of the, one of the uh, uh, questions that we raised following buried evidence is that we didn't know who was buried in the other graves. But if our small sample bears out, then it stands to reason that the 8,000 disappeared are likely buried in these graves. And that's the investigations we had asked that independent investigations be constituted. Um, to your question on genocide, I think it is for the international courts uh, to rule uh, what manner of uh, devastation has taken place in Kashmir, whether it is genocide or politicide or democide or mass murder or a combination of these things. And I think it is our burden to put the evidence before uh, 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 an independent investigative panel. But I think to be well before that can happen, there needs to be an understanding that what has taken place, especially since August 5th, is a siege. And that that needs to be discontinued in order that any other process may unfold. Uh, and that uh, uh, pressure from the international community on the Indian state would have to be step one. Um, I think the other point uh, that you touched on regarding the notion of death, because death is important to all of these sort of uh, mass exterminations in history that we have seen. It's not so much the number, but it's the intent with which death is perpetrated and the methods by which it is perpetrated and the rights of the dead. And we have repeatedly seen in Kashmir that the dead have no rights. Uh, in international law, the dead have rights. Uh, dead have no rights in Kashmir. The living barely have any rights. The dead have no rights in Kashmir. Also, the ways in which uh, death is perpetrated on, on Kashmiris is done with the intent to devastate the internal structure of Kashmiris as a people. And I think that's something very important to underscore as well. And uh, the, the, the having been to these mass graves, if you go and you see them, there's land on which there are graves some places where the grass has grown over them and you can't tell what they are, some places next to schools where they actually look like bumps on the ground, hundreds of them, and little children see them in and out every day. The, 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 what that does, that notion of death for the living to live with every day, on an everyday basis, the psychosocial impact, which is also engineered, because when after we released the report, and as I, as I said in my presentation that about 3,000 others have been identified now and they need to be verified and corroborated, but uh, a lot of press covered it from the New York Times to Kashmir Times, Times of India, Hindu, all manner of press, and people kept asking us, have you, dis you discovered these graves? Uh, we hadn't discovered them. We had simply put the spotlight on them because people lived with them for years and years and years. And that is the intent, both to produce death and to have that death impact the lives of the living and how they conduct their lives, who they can be as a people in the shadow of that death, death bound, every Kashmiri lives with the sense of that death boundedness. Um, I should stop. Yeah, anybody uh, likes to add anything to that? So, so I'll, um, I'll add a little, little to that. Um, sure. So you're asking, your question is, why would we not call this um, a genocide? And I think that the goal is a genocide when genocide is defined um, as follows. Um, any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. As such, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, 
imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So this definition is located in the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, um, which was uh, created in 1948. And the UN actually has a special advisor on the prevention of genocide. And I think that um, because, again, there has been no ability to um, uh, to basically divert Kashmiris from demanding uh, their right to self-determination, genocide really, uh, and through the mechanism of settler colonialism, is going to be India's strategy in Kashmir. And so what we're seeing is that the legal structures to enable that are already in place. And what we have to remember is when there was um, a genocide of Jews and um, other minorities in Germany, it was all pursuant, there was a bureaucracy that enabled it. And so the bureaucracy that is going to enable this genocide in Kashmir is being put in place. And when, when we are waiting for the definition to meet a genocide having happened, it will be too late. Um, and so what we need to do as members of the international community, as people who can advocate with our own um, elected representatives to exert pressure um, on the Indian government is we need to say, we cannot, we cannot wait until it is too late for a genocide to be a fait accompli. We have to interrupt the, the essentially the construction of this bureaucracy um, and of this security state and the settler colonial project um, to interrupt this genocide that is um, being set into motion. Sahela, I would, if I may add, Shakil Bhai, just one thing, Sahela, from what you said, uh, very well said, and from what you said, I want to uh, also point out that uh, this, the apparatus has been put in place over 30 years. Uh, let's not forget that. So it's not something that needs to be constituted. It is in existent, e existence and it can be repurposed. And I think that's what we are witnessing, right? That it did exist, it has perpetrated crimes, the structure of them now begins to shift, but it's not just the shift today, it's also the comp it's also the cumulative impact of what has happened before that's led to this moment, which then escalates the impact. And and to also make the to to for me it's important to note that the, the, the rubric of cultural genocide seems very much already to have been affected in Kashmir. And it is always a precursor. That's what we witnessed in Germany, for example, from 33 to 39, right? Until Kristallnacht. Uh, uh, the, the, that apparatus is up, has been operationalized. And I think 35A was sort of a, another step that maybe seeks to this that induces fear legitimate fear on part of kashmiris that now cultural genocide will coincide with physical genocide and whether that occurs through murder or whether that occurs through forms of displacement or forms of dissolution of rights uh i don't think we should wait to see that uh yes Exactly. I don't think one should wait to see that. Uh, the lack of will on part of the international community is quite staggering. And I'm hopeful that in November, maybe things will turn in this country to have more responsible leadership that would allow for these things to take somewhat more center stage. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. So I had um, uh, originally requested 90 minutes from you and, 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 and the conversation is so rich and so relevant and important that I, um, um, I, I don't want to abuse the generosity of your time to uh, do even more. Uh, but if we can, can do some closing remarks um, um, by each one of you, I think we'll reverse the order. Uh, Sahela, uh, Sarir had started us, uh, or no, Sahela had started us and Angana had ended and this time if I may reverse it and up first and then um, Sari and then Sahla for any closing remarks parting words of wisdom that you like to share with us. Not much wisdom. Um, I'm trying to find something to share with you. Just give me a minute. 
Um, if, if you want us to come back, it's okay. We can. No, use. it's okay. okay. I just want to read the testimony of someone, a, a fragment of it, who has been in Kashmir like a mentor to me, Atta Muhammad, the grave digger from Baramulla. I learned so much from him. He's a beautiful human being. Uh, and I wanted to read something he had said. Uh, I have been terrorized by this task that was forced upon me. My nights are tormented and I cannot sleep. The bodies and graves appear and reappear in my dreams. My heart is weak from this labor. I've tried to remember all this, the sound of the earth as I covered the graves, bodies and faces that are mutilated, mothers who would never find their sons. But then he says, my memory is my obligation. My memory is my contribution. I just wanted to underscore that, that the value of memory, value of remembrance for descent, for a sense of identity, for the imprint of a people on a place and for not forgetting how important that is and how much Kashmir, how resilient Kashmiris have been and how uh, undaunted in the face of brutality to give us memory with which to not forget. And uh, simply that, that maybe today needs to be a commitment uh, at least for me, born in Calcutta in India, that understood itself to be free. Uh, maybe today is a recommitting to not forgetting, not forgetting Kashmir for a start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I, I want to thank again uh, the organizers uh, of this event, uh, my panelists, co panelists, obviously. Uh, I have so much to learn from them, and uh, they have set an incredible example for not just me, but for those coming behind us to follow. And, and I would invite anybody who watched this, uh, who watches this event, either live that watched it live or uh, later on on video, uh, to really look up and research the work that these two have done, uh, highlighting the plight of uh, Kashmiris. Um, I, I would leave everybody with this. The lack of accountability will stretch everywhere if we don't cure that crime immediately. And it's not just about the prominent personalities of the Kashmiri resistance. It's not just about Mia Kuyum. It's not just about Yasin Malik. It's not just about people who have been under house arrest for tens of years, like Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani, or since August 5th, Mirwais Muhammad Umar Farooq. It is for those people that have lost their lives in just a pure abuse of impunity of power. The laborers who are being killed, the people whose bodies are being found in mass graves, uh, those who are being killed and then their murderers are being rewarded. We look at people like the martyr Jalil Andravi, who was a human rights lawyer in Kashmir who went and testified to the abuses that India was perpetrating in Kashmir uh, at Geneva Human Rights Conventions in Geneva. And his reward for that was when his body was fished out of the vellum, the eyes were gouged out. And even under those kinds of conditions, he persisted and he, he gave the ultimate sacrifice to his land. I ask everybody watching to look into these, to investigate these, to listen, to hear, and to feel what we have talked about today, and to remember those who cannot speak for themselves. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sari. Um, I really have very little to add after those profound reflections from Professor Chatterjee and from Sarir, but I would like to thank um, the UCNA Committee for Social Justice for not only hosting this webinar, but for across the country, across the United States, showing up in large numbers to support um, Kashmiris um, you know, from, from the outset of this crisis that started last year. Um, and I also wanted to offer a note of appreciation for inviting um, Kashmiris to speak on a panel about Kashmir. Um, and people and an expert who has a long history of working on Kashmir. We have a lot of um, events that often 
fail to present the people who know the issues best. Um, and I'm very conscious of the fact that I am a person who's born and raised outside of Kashmir. And so like Sarir had mentioned, I don't face those um, same threats to my personal safety. And I feel um, in the way that um, uh, the gentleman you were talking about, Professor Chatterjee was saying his memory is his obligation. I sort of feel like my voice is my obligation um, because I am I have the liberty of being safe. Um, and so I just want to offer a note of appreciation for having Kashmiri voices, for having Kashmir experts speak about this. Um, and there's a quote that I um, that I always talk about that's really important to me that guides my work. And it's by an Aboriginal elder from Australia named Lilla Watson. And she said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And so that's really what I'm hoping our allies who work with us on um, the issue of Kashmir or any other social justice issue, I hope that can be a guiding principle. We do this not because we want to be heroes and save someone else, but because we know that our liberation is bound up with one another. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, a few announcements and, uh, and then I'll, I'll close it. Uh, uh, first is to those of us who are watching this program, uh, um, please know that this will be saved on the uh, ignacsj.org website. Uh, and I would urge you to share this with your friends, with your relatives, with your neighbors, with your colleagues, with your teachers, uh, and also with your congressional reps. Really, this was an extremely rich conversation. Uh, and then, and uh, we need to uh, share this uh, freely as much as uh, possible. And, and if you like to learn more, uh, uh, standwithkashmir.org has plethora of important, valuable resources. Please use those resources to educate yourself and to share those resources with others uh, you know in your network who care for human rights of people in Kashmir and elsewhere, but in this case in, in Kashmir. Thirdly, uh, we also uh, were reminded by all the speakers to really do our part. Uh, it's good to educate and inform and, and be aware of what's happening, but if we don't translate that into action, then perhaps we are not fulfilling our responsibility as much as we should. Uh, at the bare minimum that all of us can do is now this is, we are under COVID, you can simply log on to your congressional reps website, uh, send an email with a bunch of uh, resources or simply the Stand with Kashmir resource and say, I'm interested to find out what have you done or what are you planning to do or what would you like to do or would you like to know more and engage in that conversation with your elected reps. We live in a very privileged position, all of us, as Sahla rightly said, we don't have, um, we cannot even imagine, it's not in, even in our vocabulary of what hardship means. What does it feel like to live under occupation? What does it feel like to not visit your parent, your sibling who lives across the street because you are under lockdown uh, and so on and so forth. And to my brothers and sisters in Kashmir, um, those who live in Kashmir, who at some point might be able to watch this, and those who are living in diaspora, um, uh, I, I like I like you to know you're not alone and you will never, ever be forgotten. I promise that to you. Um, that said, the, the, the last thing that I would like to announce is that next month in September, we will be examining with a similar distinguished panel uh, if genocide is in the making in India. Um, in some time in September, we will discuss that also. And I like to close with uh, two quotes. One, a short poem by Hibba Khatun, the queen of Kashmir. I left my home for play, nor yet again return, although the day sank in the west. The name I made is hailed on lips of men, Abba Khatun, though veiled, I found no rest. Through crowds I found my way from forests. Then the sages came 
when they sang in the west somewhere in your piece angana that you have quoted uh, one of the people that you have uh, khurram parvez who you have interviewed and he said and i close with this we are not free but we know freedom the movement is our freedom our dreams are our freedom the indian state cannot take that away our resistance will live and i say to khurram long live resistance okay. thank you so much to each one of you for being with us so very kind of you for giving us your weekend bless your heart bless your work and together we shall free kashmir from the indian occupation thank you so much god bless take care bye bye